I'm joining you from um, the Geneva area where it's also quite warm and it's warming up pretty fast here in my attic. I hear you guys are having a pretty warm day as well. So why don't we do a little bit of time travel and go to year 2002. The temperatures were much warmer then in the summer. Um, the climate was a lot milder here. But there was also another event that happened in Johannesburg in 2002. The World Summit on Sustainable Development happened. And one of the outcomes of that summit um, recorded in its proclamation was in fact the importance of Earth observations towards enabling countries to achieve sustainable development. And the said proclamation, in fact, put an emphasis on the need to promote access, availability and access to Earth observation to the developing countries. I know there's a lot of terminology that's being used these days, developing countries, low and middle income countries, but the point is the same that this vast asset that is data, Earth observation, needs to be accessible to all because it represents exactly that. It's a vital asset that has to drive decision making towards sustainable development. So the whole aspect of ensuring equitable access to this kind of data and information has been GEO's ethos right from the start, which was in 2005. So if any of you in the audience, and I wish I really could see you, but I can't, but if any of you in the audience have not heard of GEO, I hope that by the end of my talk, you ask yourself, where have you GEO been all my life? And then you reach out to the GEO Secretariat and we make the connection. So why open data? I understand I will probably be preaching to the choir here and to the converted, but still let's spend a quick minute on why. I know that you are all at least a believer or maybe even an evangelist for open data. Um, so let's go back over the diverse opportunities um, and benefits that open data bring. Perhaps the most important reasons are the broad economic benefits and growth for both public and private sectors. At GEO, we have seen how open data are an economic force multiplier and enhancer. They create value many times over and provide much greater returns on the investment than restrictive and proprietary approaches. We've seen this play out when the US government released the Landsat archive. There is vast um, information available on how that drove um, innovation, economic activity. Uh, but even more recently, a World Economic Forum report calculated that one of the innovations that GEO community was part of the creation of the Digital Earth Africa, which uses open data cube technology, could bring Africa yearly benefits of more than $2 billion. In addition, open upstream data stimulate downstream commercial research and applications that benefit economies and wider society. Openness also provides increased opportunities for research and innovation. Data can substantially reduce unproductive barriers to interdisciplinary, interinstitutional, and international research. And in a growing sea of big data, they enable data mining for automated knowledge discovery. Open data, we also say, are essential for the verification of research results and in generating broad trust in them. They avoid inefficiencies and such as the unnecessary duplication of research and the identification of erroneous results. You guys all know this. I'm not the one to tell you about these benefits. Open data promotes the education of new students and the public and engagement of the citizens. This is why nonprofit research and education sectors were given special status or in the early part of GEO when we first developed the data sharing principles. But finally, and this is where uh, Baron Orr um, spoke to um, just before lunch break, open data are key 
advantage for improved governance and social welfare. Public data made openly available support improved decision making and transparency in government and society. Access to open data and information really allows for creating coherence, coherence in policies, coherence in governance, coherence in international regimes. For less economically developed countries, open data policies help close the digital divide, promote capacity strengthening, and help them to implement what in some uh, narratives and discourses known as repatriation objectives. For example, by digitizing species and specimen level data that has been collected abroad and making them freely available. Not least, open public data generally build freedom in society and trust in governance and its many functions. Now, I know that what I've just said is not always the case. Sometimes openness also creates issues in the governance because sometimes it also creates uh, sort of puts a spotlight on information that's not always desirable to be shared. But in the context and in the principles of creating democracies, transparency and accountability, open data is truly transformational. So in short, countries and organizations stand to gain much more than they lose from making their Earth observation data available on a full and open basis, freely and without reuse restrictions. And that is what GEO promotes. Members of GEO subscribe to this set of principles. Not all of our members have fully implemented the open data sharing principles. And so our work in this space is never finished. We are continuing to promote it. We are continuing the advocacy. And one of the things that we did just last year, very much building on the work that was started by my predecessor, and I'm assuming Gilberto is in the room. Again, I wish I could see the audience, but if Gilberto Kamara is in the room, then um, he deserves a round of applause because he started a movement in GEO towards. Is he there? He's here. He'll, he'll be speaking after you. OK, so he started a movement which we sort of took through the finish line as far as putting things on paper are, are concerned. And last year at the GEO plenary in the fall, uh, our community adopted the principles of open knowledge um, as that by which we will try to guide our work. So what does that really mean? Um, it means that, um, you know, we are um, aiming to lower the barriers for everyone who might benefit from the use of authoritative knowledge. And so for this, we need open science. Openness in science is fundamental requirement to ensure the integrity of research, accelerate scientific progress, and disseminate knowledge among scientists, decision makers, and increasingly so, the involved citizens. All stages of the research process should be findable, accessible, and reusable. Open data needed to reproduce scientific results or support public decision making should be released publicly under an open data license and follow the geo data sharing and management principles. Alongside the geo um, principles, there are also a set of principles that have received vast recognition globally, and those are the FAIR principles, of course, the trust principles to use trustworthy repositories and care principles, collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility and ethics. And this set of principles are inc increasingly important in our work where we are pushing for more um, culturally sensitive and culturally aware engagement with the traditional communities, with the indigenous communities and indigenous people and local communities. Open software, any kind of software we say developed during the research process should be released under an open license and also in accordance with fair and trust principles. And then, of course, there is the open source and um, open code movement and open science, 
which is also gaining momentum uh, very much through the efforts of a project such as Open EO Monitor and the open source communities like Open Geo and others. It's also great to see that this open source movement is spreading into the operational world. I, I really loved reading, what was it, about a month ago or so, uh, that ECM WF, uh, WF was making some of its integrated forecast system um, available on open source basis. They did that because they realized that collaboration on the code is important and it, as it can bring about a lot of improvements to the model. So what is GEO doing to put these principles into action and deliver benefits for the environment and society? Again, I'm giving uh, all due credit to my predecessor, Gilberto. We've created the GEO Knowledge Hub as part of that movement that Gilberto started, an open source digital repository of reproducible authoritative knowledge. We now have more than 28 uh, knowledge packages, including research papers and reports describing methods and results, software algorithms and cloud, cloud computing resources used for processing, as well as um, some in-situ and satellite imagery data used um, for results uh, and verification. The idea is that by making the results of GEO's work available through this digital repository, any user community out there, be it at the national, subnational, local level, whether it's, uh, but probably still semi-expert level, will be able to reproduce and replicate these uh, results in their national context by taking into account the local context. We've supported initiatives such as Digital Earth Africa. I spoke to this just a minute earlier, which has Open Data Cube as its backend technology, which provides open, free, and ready to use Earth observation data sets. The services, the operational services that are being developed on uh, the basis of Digital Earth Africa, they are tailored to the regional context and to the national context. Um, many of our activities that have open APIs, they run on Digital Earth Africa, and then they are being picked up by the various country users and then run in their own um, systems, many of them also based on open data cube technology. We're working with, in fact, a large community of open data cube users through Open Earth Alliance, which is a fairly new but not you know, three or so years old, a community that's really driving um, the use of Open Data Cube technology by sharing the applications that are being developed um, by them, their usability. Um, so it's all about sort of creating a community that can leverage um, ongoing experiences to create to promote um, increased use of these open technologies. Um, for um, data analysis and um, developing workflows that can go straight into the decision making. Um, we are pushing for access to cloud credits, to I should say to cloud technologies, by working through big technology companies who provide credits to those cloud technologies in order to enable open data analysis. We've been working with AWS, Google and Microsoft granting 70 or so projects, cloud credits and cash with Microsoft, with focus on low and middle income countries. And because these programs are being coordinated under the umbrella of GEO, we expect that the results uh, will be made open. So how can we support each other? I mean, based on everything that I've just said so far, I think it's pretty clear why, why I'm here speaking to this audience, because it seems like um, GEO and Open EO Monitor's community are kind of fit for each other. Um, some might say maybe we're a match made in heaven. Um, I think there is a lot that the GEO community has done that can provide input to the work that you are embarking on. 
Um, like I was saying, we have 60 plus activities in the work program, and this could be an area for collaboration. You heard earlier from um, Baron Orr about GOLDN. It's one of our really um, terrific activities, and I'm so glad he spoke to it and sort of explained the value of the land degradation sort of community coming together under GEO's umbrella to really take this globally standardized approach to developing tools that can then be exploited by uh, national users and really be empowered to not just do the reporting, but actually take real action on conservation, restoration, ecosystem management. There is a whole series of activities that are already there, sitting there in our work program and can really benefit from the innovation of open um, source community to develop tools that can really put them into sort of usable format, usable um, user friendly kind of format uh, packaging um, to make them a lot more accessible and ready for um, uptake. Our data working group is also leading work, uh, which is relevant to your efforts to develop an inventory of end user needs. I think one of your work packages um, will be focusing on that. We have surveyed the GeoWork program partners to understand their experiences of using and producing data, including in situ, asking what are the barriers they face? How can data be more accessible? Soon we will be releasing new guidelines on the geodata management principles. And I saw that part of your work also includes uh, an objective to develop a data management plan. So we'd love to see the work that was done by the geo community. And look, many of you I know are part of that community, um, including some of these working groups and activities that I've mentioned. So it would be great to see some of this work um, being picked up in the course of Open EO Monitor project to first of all see if they're relevant. That would be useful feedback back to us. And as uh, one of the speakers, I think Patrick from ESA was saying earlier, let's not recreate what's already there. Let's leverage the human and capital investments that have been made already to give them more return on um, the investments that was made, but also kind of give you a bit of a head start where that information can be in fact useful. So we would love to engage more with the open source community. We've been now um, engaging with FOS4G conference for a couple of years, running a special track um, for engaging through GEO on creating more and more tools um, using open source. Um, so this really kind of a good fit for us right here. And so to kick off the discussion, because I was asked to potentially throw a couple questions to the audience in case you've hit a dry spell and can't generate questions on your own, although that doesn't seem to be the case. So I've just put a couple of very easy peasy questions. We don't even need to go to these questions and can start with whatever appears on your screen. Um, but I'll leave it here and thanks very much for having me here. Um, and I hope we do continue the conversation um, in GEO. So let's start with this first one at the top here. Much of the ground data used in Digital Earth Africa is from elsewhere, e.g. Barren Earth is Australia data. So how does GEO support ground data collection? Well, GEO is the countries in um, on the continent of Africa, so it's really within the Digital Earth Africa community, which is very active, where they literally, through their series of governing bodies, um, technical committee, are discussing everything from the level of their priority needs for various services to where they go for their in situ data collection. And um, it, it's very much within their hands. Africa owned, actually, just recently, they've transitioned the uh, ownership of the program management um, office to Africa as well. So it's very much driven by um, the institutions 
um, academic institutions and operational institutions um, within the Di uh, Digital Earth Africa Consortium. Great, okay, let's stick with Digital Earth Africa for a second because we have some more questions in that line. Uh, can Open EO work on top of an open data cube um, concerning Digital Earth Africa? So, Juan, uh, based on what I heard uh, during the presentation and uh, our chats uh, at the Secretariat, I think the answer is yes. Um, again, I probably will have to cheat and um, ask if I'm speaking mistruths, then Gilberto can really call me out and, and correct me. Uh, but I'm pretty sure the answer to that is yes. Great. Um, OK, we have one from Tom. Which public repository do you recommend for registering geodata? AWS Open Data, Zenodo, GEE, uh, which ones do you harvest? So the harvesting at the moment um, is being done on the GEOS platform um, because the Knowledge Hub is not really harvesting data. Um, and the platform, mm, I kind of wish that I had somebody here who really knows um, which of these uh, platforms, the GEOS platform, and I don't know, Jean Dussard, if you know that. Um, I don't I don't know the, the exact answer to that question, whether it's actually harvesting from GE or AWS. Okay, no problem. We can... Um save that one and uh, maybe there's someone in the audience who can uh, contribute to it later. Uh, let's go with one more question, um, tying it back into our project of focus today. How could the Open Earth Monitor and similar projects make use of your geo portal? Um, okay, so the geo portal, um, currently provides discoverability and accessibility to some data and information. Um, I think depending on your needs, um, and I have not seen exactly what applications, what sort of um, thematic, thematically speaking, you will be uh, tackling with OpenEO Monitor. Um, but depending on that, you may or may not find find everything you need. I doubt at the moment that you will need every you will find everything you need in the geo portal. Um, Jean Dussard, I think, alluded to this in his opening remarks. We are aware of um, some limitations of um, the portal um, and, or I should say, the platform that's behind it, and that's why there is currently a review of um, the said infrastructure um, with broad engagement with the user community, um, both on the provider side, intermediary side, and kind of downstream, um, because we do want to understand exactly what type of um, assets are particularly necessary for the communities that are driving open innovation so that the investments that will continue to be made into geo infrastructure can in fact be done with that knowledge. That may mean certain uh, changes to that platform. I mean, portal is just the interface, right? So we're really talking about what's behind it. I know another European uh, funded um, project, the GEOS uh, Platform Plus, is currently looking at that evolution. So again, I would try to put the ball in their accord. Um, this is probably the best of a generic kind of answer that I can give. Great, that's fine, thank you.